So for this session, I'd like to welcome to the stage Evan Miazono of Protocol Labs, Pooja Olhaver of Flashbots, Kevin Owaki with Gitcoin, and Annette Rolikova with the Ethereum Magicians. So I'd like to take it away to Annette. Hi, Pooja. Hello, everyone. Hi, Hi Pooja. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, good afternoon. I hope that everybody is doing good. Um, so let's start this panel, right? Or okay. Um, so uh, what everybody, what people should know about you guys, like about like public goods, or what's something that you would love to tell to the crowd? Yeah, uh, Pooja, why don't you go first? It's introduction. Sure. Uh, I'm a, thank you. I'm a strategist at Flashbots, and uh, I recently co-authored a paper called Decentralized Society, Find a Place to Solve. And uh, yeah, that's about it. It is surprisingly hard to hear you, Pooja, just as a heads up. I think it might be easier for the audience, but it's a little difficult for us. We will be leaning forward, et cetera, to try and hear you. Um, as far as my answer, I... Uh, I would say that, well, I work at Protocol Labs. I've been doing research and other public goods and commons type funding. And the thing that I think is most relevant for this group to know about public goods is that usually when I talk about it, I'm, a, I'm grouping public goods and commons and some set of like club goods or toll goods in the economic definition sense to talk about these like network goods that are things that you that are incredibly valuable but often difficult to ex like generate funding from in order to sustain themselves. So just good things that we want more of but are hard to generally create. Hey, y'all. I'm Kevin Owaki. I'm a member of Gitcoin DAO. Our mission is to build and fund digital public goods. And right now we're focused on blockchain ecosystem public goods by deploying quarterly $3 million quadratic funding rounds. Gitcoin Grants Round 14 starts today. So uh, go to gitcoin.co slash grants if you want to leverage our crowdfunding platform to raise for your digital public goods. And I also wrote a book uh, called Green Pilled, How to Crypto Can Regenerate the World. And I'll be signing copies after this event. Great to be here. Yeah, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, so you guys have very unique opportunity um, to get your uh, green pill book signed about the celebrity itself, Kevin. Um, so the first question that I would love to ask you guys, what do you guys think of uh, the funding of public goods, how it will look like in the next five years? Who should start, Annette? I'm not sure who wants to start. Um, I mean, I, Evan, so yeah. one of the things that I've been thinking about for sustainable funding of public goods is that I think there's a, uh, a nice analog to be drawn between these crypto projects that have resources and are allocating towards building and developing better infrastructure and the way that governments that issue currencies also will have social safety nets or roads, bridges, that kind of infrastructure. It, they're like, it's the kind of thing that's free to anyone who wants to use it, but it also creates huge value for everyone who participates in that society or community and, or that network. And as a result, you have a net increase in value and the hope that I would love to see for a lot of these crypto projects is uh, more robust and quantitative thinking about the way in which contributing to those goods results in a positive feedback loop. And I think this is, I, I would definitely recommend the book Green Pill. This is a, the same direction that uh, regenerative crypto economics is going. But I think that there is, and I think there's additionally some rigor and like quantitative metrics that we could apply to that. And I look forward to seeing uh, crypto projects that look more like traditional government, like governance and governments that are sovereign currency issuers and treat the, current, the tokens they issue as currencies that should be used and uh, like 
tie together an ecosystem that is similar to the way com countries have economies. Kind of rambly. Kevin, do you have some words on that as well? Yeah, remind me what the question was. Uh, the question was about the funding of public goods uh, for the future, next uh, five years. Yeah, so I mean, I think that um, one of the big opportunities in the space is to reinvent how public goods are funded and leveraging this transparent, immutable, programmable global monetary system in order to create more capital efficient ways of creating impact for public goods. I am a pluralist, a practical pluralist, and I believe that there will be many examples of ways to fund public goods and we should embrace pluralism in our public goods funding infrastructure. And so at Gitcoin, we like to embrace our partners at Giveth or CLR Fund uh, and the Ethereum Foundation, all of these grant giving bodies in the ecosystem and embrace a pluralistic approach to building a civilizational scale funding infrastructure for public goods. And so letting a thousand experiments blossom is kind of how I view this thing right now. Big fan of Puget's work with decentralized society. The vision that you all put forth in that paper of all these systems being interoperable with each other, issuing soul bound NFTs and using the data at the intersection of users, attestations and communities, I think is going to be a core part of building up a reputational layer that'll allow us to identify who's in what community and help build and fund public goods. Uh, I happen to be really focused on quadratic funding, which we can get into later. That's kind of our niche at Gitcoin is doing quadratic funding, but we're trying to be natively interoperable with all the other people who are doing it as well. So pluralism is the answer, Annette. Uh, Pooja, do you have something to tell us about the future of uh, public gets funding as well? Sure. Can you guys hear me well on the stage? Yeah, yes. sounds great. Okay, wonderful. Yeah, so this was actually uh, one of the main motivations of writing the paper, of answering this question about how we achieve broader, complex network coordination to solve the global challenges of the 21st century, but in a bottom-up and decentralized way. And decentralized, so you know, a particular set of social groups or actors don't come to dominate the network, or where the network's power also is limited to solving problems at its social scale and not social scales underneath it. So Gitcoin and Kevin has done a lot of amazing work on uh, forging the path of quadratic funding and quadratic voting and running experiments there. Uh, but one of the things that we talk about in the paper is that we need to take that a step up because what that does is even though it rewards cooperation of the many over the few and consensus of the many over the few, what it also does is it allows, uh, say, weekly organized or weekly coordinated uh, groups, social groups to uh, dominate a mechanism. And so what we did and our paper is introduced as primitive called soulbound tokens, which represent memberships and affiliations and credentials. And getting that uh, representation, uh, that social substrate, allows us to do a second step on existing uh, quadratic funding and voting mechanisms. And that second step is elevating cooperation across differences. And co elevating cooperation across differences, we, we really think is key to uh, public goods and the intuition there is that uh, consensus between say more disparate or adversarial groups signals consensus for broader public goods than say consensus among very similarly affiliated cooperating groups which is more likely to be collusion for a narrow good serving a narrow special interest. So what in our paper what we really tried to do was try to um, uh, unpack what we really mean by public goods um, and, and actually pivoted to this notion of plural goods, which is just consensus across differences uh, to signal broad, uh, broad goods, broad shared goods over narrow goods. And I think one very critical piece of the DSOC paper, that I, which I love, by the way, um, would definitely recommend it to anyone who is considering uh, reading it. This is uh, oh, like paper Puja published, or wrote and published last month. Uh, there's an element of social, like community 
membership and social pressure and value to build a civil resistance mechanism that can be fairly generalized and leveraged by other systems. Uh, quadratic voting is something that really benefits from having better civil resistance. I would say any government governance mechanism really benefits from being able to identify separate individuals and re reduce, reduce the likelihood of civil identities. And uh, actually, Pooja, because we have you here, I'd love to hear your, like, your succinct explanation of why people might opt into that or how you generate this thing that I think is fundamentally difficult when you want infrastructure, like how you have civil resistance that seems to be roughly opt-in, which is super relevant for all public goods, but has been something that I think a lot of uh, token projects have struggled with where you end up with one token, one vote, or one GPU, one vote type systems. Yeah, so your question is, is how do we, how do we get this off the ground? Like, why would people actually do this? Um, so you, you've already kind of answered the question partially yourself, is, yeah, DAOs, protocols struggle with civil resistance, but most importantly, the whole premise of crypto is decentralization. And it's what justifies us not being regulated by any trust laws or by securities regulation, because there aren't the asymmetries in power, information, and control. Right? And so the challenge for crypto to continue to justify its existence is to start to explain what we mean by decentralization. Right? And so I think one, one, one incentive here kind of just uh, you know, philosophically is if, if you want to operate decentralized and, and get your free pass, then we need to start quantifying that and doing a better job there. Um, the, other, the other thing is, so what, one kind of, uh, a misconception about soulbound tokens is that they kind of are this um, representation of your government ID. They're not. They're actually, you know, our view of identity is not that it's the, you know, accidental happenstance that you're born into, the place, time of birth, but it's really the intentional social relationships you grow into. And so those social uh, SBTs represent those communities and their memberships, and they don't just represent it, but they should also be useful to the communities unlocking, for example, access to community resources or per permissioning your participation in governance. So SBTs should be useful to DAOs um, in terms of enabling, uh, uh, in terms of permissioning access and, and, and allocating rights and responsibilities. I do think that there are some communities that uh, need this like right now. Um, I think open source communities and scientific communities that are kind of under the thumb of rent extracting monopolies have very strong incentives to adopt this and that might actually just be perfect because it's a small set of uh, people without you know high publicity anyway and the incentives you know we, we can test incentives without um, you know risking too much thank you i hope that answers the question um what do you guys think like kevin um, what do you think about uh soulbound tokens can soulbound tokens solution help us with civil resistance and how public goods works uh, with cellbound tokens against or towards civil resistance? My take is that uh, the idea of having robust identities online that are kind of opt-in and community-based seems incredibly powerful. And I, I think that whenever you have any, well, both corporations in a capitalist society and governments in a democratic society are trying to elicit what people, like preferences, they're doing preference elicitation and aggregation. They're trying to figure out what people want, what priorities do they have, uh, what order do they want the things in. And what's interesting about DAOs is that it kind of spans this spectrum between corporation and government, and uh, or at least they aspire to, and without soulbound tokens, or like without some robust source of identity, you can't get to a one person, one vote end of the spectrum. All you can do is try to get there. And I think that having some robust decentralized society type metro, like tool for civil resistance, um, be they soulbound tokens, be they uh, self-sovereign identification, which is roughly another name for the same at least path, if not end goal, um, is that you can start having better governance start having group initiatives that have more robust buy-in 
where it isn't just what most of the capital wants, it's what most of the people want waiting by individual. So I think it's incredibly impactful in terms of the future of infrastructure funding. Yeah, I'll just say yes is the answer, and yes and is the better answer. Soulbound tokens, DIDs, verifiable credentials, on-chain history, non-soulbound tokens. I actually think POAP, it's not a soulbound token, but it's going to be really important for bootstrapping the data set of decentralized society. And uh, I'll, just, I'll just shill real quick that Gitcoin is decentralizing its civil resistance tools. Passport.gitcoin.co is the first time we're using a decentralized protocol for civil resistance in Gitcoin grants. And we only aim to open up the civil resistance of Gitcoin to the rest of the ecosystem sometime in the next quarter or two. And the idea is to jumpstart a move from one token, one vote systems, which are, can be captured by capital providers to one human, one vote systems, which are fundamentally more democratic. And I think it's such a core money Lego to solve civil resistance. So yeah, yes is the answer. Yeah, and if I can extend the shilling to shill some of my own stuff, um, I want to definitely extend and say that uh, every mechanism that Kevin named is super useful and impactful, and we need a patchwork of them to try and cover all of the use cases. And in an effort to identify new tools and mechanisms, I and my team and I have been running a conference, funding the commons.io. Uh, next one is in two weeks in New York, so if you happen to be around, I would definitely recommend it. Uh, funding the commons.io is the website, very easy to find. Would definitely love to see all of you there. Do you guys think that like civil resistance is like goes hand in hand with anonymity in terms of can anons use like civil resistance mechanism and still stay anon because eventually in civil resistance it's somehow you have to have sort of like a real identity and especially decentralized internet or like anons on the internet want to stay anon and want to use their like fake names and using like fake email addresses or like not trying to like tie their real identity to their real to their online personality so how civil resistance and how maybe even soulbound tokens solve these issues i view them as very correlated but not mutually exclusive i think that allowing a use case to decide how civil resistant you want the thing to be versus how, um, how much you want to allow anonymity is just a choice that needs to be made by a use case and a user. And like, as long as those choices can be made at the time, uh, we're in a better place than we are now where like, to prove your age, you need to reveal your home address. Yeah, uh, I think that right now there's a trade-off between those two things, uh, keeping your personal identity separate and the amount of civil resistance. But I think that in five years' time, there'll be ways to create thousands or tens of thousand dollars worth of civil resistance cost of forgery without doxing yourself. I, I think that we're going to innovate there in this ecosystem. And I think there's amazing DSOC stuff where like, it doesn't even make sense to measure the, the cost of forgery because it's your reputation on the line and your reputation can be priceless in some ways. Yeah, totally. I think that we need, what we need to do is we need to create this virtuous cycle where people start to bootstrap their civil resistant identity and therefore they derive utility from dApps that are civil resistant and say Gitcoin grants, maybe rabbit hole, other reward systems that only give it to people if you have a passport. And then so you've got people with their identities, they've got utility that they're getting, and then that brings in more dApps, which creates an incentive for people to add more to their civil resistant identity, which means more rewards, which means more dApps, and spinning that virtuous cycle. This is the network effect problem. More supply, more demand. More demand creates more supply and vice versa. So we just gotta spin that cycle together. And I think Pooja and Vitalik and Glenn really laid out a kind of North Star for what that could look like. And so the pieces are really starting to come together. But I'd like to jump in here. Um, uh, there's this 
uh, I think general confusion that one person, like one human, one vote is kind of what we're trying to get after, and that's actually not the case. Right. If that were the case, then proof of personhood protocols would just do the job. And in fact, what we're proposing is a pseudonymous proposal, right? Uh, and maybe even multiple quote unquote souls here, uh, maybe a hell soul, a political soul, so on. So I don't think you actually need a one human, one vote situation. What we're really interested in is in what are the social correlations and social affiliations. Because if you just have one person, right, one vote, you could still have, say, a nation state like swamp and dominate a, you know, majoritarian influences dominate minority interests. And so the key, the key inside of the paper is that decentralization is not just, you know, one share to, to, to one person equally across the globe. It's actually pitting, right, these adversarial interests against each other and elevating the consensus across these differences. And elevating consensus across differences really means just looking at social correlations, um, not just on one soul, but like many souls, you could do that. And, and that could meaningfully achieve decentralization. Just, just wanted to footnote that. Great point. Thank you, Pusha. Um, do you guys see uh, governments using DAOs for managing their public treasuries in the future? and like using internet public goods in order to like manage real governments. Isn't there a city that was already doing that? They had some DAO and like a, a city token experiment. O Oak, I think maybe you're thinking of the Oak community currency or Miami coin. Okay, I guess we're just gonna wander around <laughs> aloud on stage. Yeah, I'm totally blanking on where it was, but I thought that I had read about some yeah. city or town, a municipality that had issued a token and was trying to yeah. get that up. I, I think that what we're going to see is we're, there's a, a, a risk promis promiscuity curve with the innovators being the most promiscuous, the early adopters being a little bit less promiscuous, but still pretty high on the curve, and the early majority, and then the late majority, and then the laggards. And I tend to see the federal and state governments to be laggards. Maybe some cities will be early majority, even early adopters. But the way to prototype these public goods things right now, I think, are with people who are already Web3 native. And I know this because Gitcoin just fell ass backwards into this audience that already understood private keys and MetaMask and transactions and stuff. And so we were actually able to just focus on bootstrapping public goods and like there's people actually using it because we're using crypto native promiscuous audience. And so I think proving it out in the more promiscuous audiences like the early adopters and then moving along that curve is how we're gonna get there. And if you take a decades long time horizon, Annette, I think we absolutely will see city, state, and national governments using DAO and uh, protocol-based public goods technology because it's just so much more efficient. Transparency and immutability creates accountability. So I think impact DAOs are really gonna disrupt NGOs and government public goods things, uh, hopefully for the better. What's your like vision for the infrastructure in public goods or like what's something that you wish there will be in terms of infrastructure built in public goods terms? And I'm especially asking this question as today the Robson uh, testnet got merged on proof of state network. So in terms of like public goods for the future of Ethereum, what's your like vision that we are like missing in the ecosystem? I mean, my answer is definitely going to be about impact certificates. Kevin and I are collaborating on, our teams are collaborating on something in this direction. And I'm really excited by the idea that you could not only track who had impact on the creation or acceleration or development of some public goods or commons, um, some infrastructure, but I think that we could create a social expectation 
that we are doing this, that we talk about what we're doing to support this, we normalize that support, and maybe even start some traditions around emphasizing that we are continuing to support, celebrating the people who are supporting it more. And uh, one thing that I'm hoping to do at Funding the Commons is have all speaker, uh, normalize the idea that speakers will spend the first uh, minute or two of their presentation talking about some certificate of impact they have. This is just something that signifies that they have bragging rights about a project. You could imagine the equivalent of uh, rookie baseball cards um, being incredibly valuable to the people who are fans of that athlete later in their career. We should have that for infrastructure and public goods. I see absolutely no economic reason why we couldn't or shouldn't or technological reason. It's purely a social thing. It's unclear who would be the one generating them and what the standardized one would be and how it would be or how, what shape it would take. But it feels very intuitive that this could be an NFT. Um, minted on Ethereum, stored on Filecoin, et cetera. But you could have this, you could generate it, and then talk about these, trade them, uh, emphasize that these are proofs that you have the bragging rights, that you supported this either with your time or with your resources in some way, and it, that you should be celebrated as an individual for finding that, not as like normal philanthropists of like, with some X amount of money where their rep reputation goes up with the amount of money, but where it's the impact that you had per dollar, et cetera. So that's something I'm really excited about in the future. So that's like a perfect example. So I'm just gonna jump in. That's like, you were asking like, what, what would be like a, a use case or like this full start? That's like a great example for a cell bond token because you wouldn't want your impact certificate to be transferred to somebody else. You'd wanna keep those bragging rights right to yourself. I think it could be. I think there could be some portion of it that's like, I was the one who actually did this. But it could also be valuable to have something that looks like an art NFT, where every time it gets traded, some additional value goes to the people who, had the, who did the initial work. And so I see no reason why it couldn't be a bipartite solution like that. Yeah, a lot of, a lot of the idea around SVPs is that actually they're not just represent individual credentials, or they're actually like community property, right? And so you can have partial and plural uh, cooperations and right, people, people uh, who are part of a group or continuously contribute to a project and continuously create impact, right, uh, are represented by that as well. Yeah, I love it. Definitely think it's gonna be the future. Um, I think that impact certificates are genius because what they do is they give projects that are, well, if there's a liquid market for impact certificates and there's buy pressure on it, then what you've done is anyone who's creating positive impact on the world instantly has a revenue model. So if you take 10 children out of poverty, if you remove 10 tons of carbon from the atmosphere, uh, if you create some other positive impact on the world, if, they're, if you're issuing impact certificates and they're legitimate and there's buying pressure for them, then what you do is you give everything that, everyone who's working on an impact out an instant business model and cash flows. And so that's just one mechanism for doing it. But I'm really excited about a world in which impact DAOs are getting revenues for creating value in the world. And how can we create a world in, like this is the retroactive public goods vision also, by the way, which is if you are creating impact on public goods, then you will be rewarded by a future mechanism that retroactively rewards people contributing on public goods. So there's just a huge leverage point in I think making these projects more financially viable. And then that enables VCs and anyone who's supporting private goods projects with their funding infrastructure to invest in these public goods projects. And I think that would be a huge cycle of innovation if we can enable that. So that's what I wanna see, Annette. So the future is public goods? And public goods are good. Future is absolutely public goods. Anything else, Pusha, you would like to tell us regarding public goods? Yeah, I think uh, uh, public goods are, the, the challenge, I think, as Kevin just alluded to, is getting, uh, getting the public goods funded. And there's, um, I'm very excited about all these mechanisms and creating flywheels. I, my, my personal approach is to you know, figure out where the rent extraction is happening and where the monopolists are and use DAOs to fork that and then self-fund in that way. Um, 
but and harbinger taxes are like another way to fund as well. Um, but yeah, I, I think crypto is definitely leading the, the, the innovation in public goods, and I'm very bullish that these mechanisms will be, uh, you know, adopted and tested in crypto cities, and 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 uh, will speak for themselves for a more widespread adoption. Thank you so much for uh, the panelists to um, giving us uh, insights into public goods. Thank you so much, everyone, for listening our conversation. Thank you so much, everyone who joined us virtually. I hope you guys enjoy this and see you around. Thanks, Annette. Yeah, thanks, Annette. Thanks, everyone. Thank